Okay, so I uh, wanted to talk to you today about um, a quality improvement project that we've been doing um, at the practice that I work in. Um, I'm based in Western Vale Family Practice um, in that uh, green bit between uh, Cardiff and Bridge End. And I um, wanted to talk about the quality improvement project because it looks at uh, how best to use the, the pharmacy team, but also the wider MGT to um, manage chronic disease um, and prescribing. So in terms of what I consider the role of uh, the pharmacy team to be in general practice, I think um, a picture speaks a thousand words and that's certainly my picture. Um, I think pharmacy teams are used to being the tiny ship of order in the vast sea of chaos. Uh, we're used to being very busy, being very pressurized, being very reactive. But I think that we kind of pride ourselves on being orderly and organized. Um, I personally prefer the, the phrase uh, a control enthusiast, but um, I like things neat and I think that that's our strength. And when I joined the practice, it was in April of 2019, um, medium large practice, 12,000 people based across three sites. And I, my instinct was to roll up my sleeves, crack on, dive headfirst into the vast sea of chaos. But I worried that if I did that, I might sink like a pebble, um, never be seen again. So I thought that it would be prudent to kind of look before we leap. Let's think about how we're going to use what is a relatively small resource. So I work five sessions a week. We've got a brilliant cluster pharmacist, very fortunate, but he only works three sessions a week. So between us, we're still not full time. And it just felt like how best could we use that limited resource um, to maximum sort of effect. Um, it became clear to me that really there are two sort of almost conflicting things going on in general practice, really. Massive pressures, huge demand, but they can be sort of split up into the hot stuff, the acute, the acute on chronic, the exacerbations, um, that reactive stuff, managing undifferentiated um, presentations, if you like. And then the cold stream. So the stuff that's planned, the stuff that's, that's evidence-based kind of provision for defined cohorts of patients. Um, monitoring medicines and you know their optimization and it was that part that I felt that really we could make the biggest contribution in so the aim of the quality improvement project was to try and improve and smooth the flow there kind of manage the manageable if you like tame that bit of the chaos um, because I felt that that would actually free up more time um, for the GP partners and um, salaried and, and GP registrars to be able to, to manage more of the hot stuff and make full use of our MDT. We're really fortunate. We've got a quite broad MDT here, we've got a couple of nurse practitioner prescribers, um, as well as practice nurses, healthcare assistants, phlebotomists, you know, a really wide MDT. So I thought that to try and understand um, how best to use that resource and have the sort of structure of a quality improvement project. And um, so I was able to negotiate with the partners that um, they managed before without a pharmacist. And so could, before I started seeing patients, could we run this project first and look before we leave, if you like. So we found it quite useful to have the structure of a, of a quality improvement kind of methodology. Um, I quite like this Japanese one, um, Kaizen, meaning good change, because there's one thing we've all learned in the last 18 months is that not all change is good. Um, so how can you improve things by taking a really structured approach? So properly understanding your problem, um, and then getting buy-in from the whole team and really getting um, to grips with exactly mapping the flow of what that, that current process is and what the problems and, and sort of shortcomings of that were before then using that to design um, a new process and, and potentially um, the solutions, uh, evaluating it and then obviously making it standard practice. So that was the plan. So in terms of step-by-step, -step, this I think is the most important step for me. Um, my favourite Japanese word, nemuwashi, the Japanese belief that you can transplant the biggest tree if you get the whole village to help you dig around the roots. So that was the plan, just buy in from across the MDT, both within the practice, um, you know, in terms of chronic disease, those patients get contact with everybody from the reception and admin teams through the clinical team, um, but also outside the practice, there are stakeholders as well. So we're very fortunate here, the Western Vale is quite a sort of... Uh, operates as almost a sealed unit, almost all of our prescriptions here get dispensed within the Western Vale. That's only half a dozen pharmacies, so we went out to meet them and, and we wanted everybody to buy in to how we could improve the way that repeat prescribing, but also um, chronic diseases were managed in the practice. And it was that sort of buy-in that I think was essential right from the beginning. We had to own this as well as improving outcomes for our patients. We wanted this to be a better place to work. 
Um, and we wanted everybody to invest because we knew that there was going to be some pain. Um, and we wanted everybody to be invested and to, and to be able to see the benefits. So first things first, we had to try and understand what was happening, what the process that, that we'd sort of come into was. Um, and it just rapidly became apparent that it's incredibly complicated. So the way that different disease states were managed and the way different medicines were managed involved lots of intricate built separately processes that had all evolved over the years. Um, none of them were synchronized, none of them were joined up. Um, they didn't all have a great deal to do with each other. They were often being done on sort of um, either ad hoc opportunistic basis, you know, oh, whilst you're here, um, if a patient was presenting acutely, a doctor might try to tag on a medication review or, or a diabetes review to tick that box. Um, and, and it was that kind of disharmony and kind of almost clash of agenda that, that felt most unsatisfactory about the whole thing. And um, it was about trying to minimize the duplication in effort, but also the failure demand, because there were lots and lots of prescription queries. Most of them were around kind of, can you reauthorize my medicines? The pharmacies run out of my batch prescriptions. That was generating demand in and of itself. Um, and we just thought we need to really understand exactly what the process is. So I make no apologies for the incredible complexity of this slide that kind of is the patient's journey. So this is an example of a patient um, who's got diabetes, COPD, dementia, hypothyroidism, and this is how many times she was seen. So this is a real patient and she was seen on 14 occasions over the course of the year independently for all of the different routine reviews that should be, could be planned for this one individual patient. And um, we were quite fortunate because at the time, um, we were thinking about this and doing this project, we had an invitation to attend an opportunity costing workshop um, run by uh, Paul Gimson, who I firmly believe has shares in post-it notes, um, because it enabled us to take time out of the practice, um, myself, practice manager and um, the prescribing EGP, um, and just think about what does our current process, so we took, for example, a diabetic patient, what does their routine annual review currently look like? And then down the left-hand side, each swim lane um, represents a different member of our, our team. So who, who is doing what? And because then we could say roughly how long is each of those interactions taking, because we know how much each of those people get paid an hour, we were able in the right-hand column to assign a cost to that, an indicative cost. So who is looking after this patient's routine diabetes review? <clears throat> so the reception team or the prescribing clerk would flag up a query to the GP, patient's medication needs reviewing, uh, GP then would have that query, access the patient's notes, fill out a blood test form, give it back to the reception, say when they're back they need a diabetes review, uh, then that patient would come back through then a phlebotomist for a blood test, the results which go back to the GP, who would then do the, uh, the, the uh, review with the patient. So all of that was, was costing uh, £43.73 per year for that one patient. And we just felt that there had to be an easier way. As I say, what about the asthmatic diabetics? What about the diabetics on DOEX? What about the DMARDs? How can we bring it all into to one stop kind of shop, if you like, a holistic review? So we happened upon the idea we've got 12,000 patients on the list. How can we spread them evenly through the year? And it occurred to us that why don't we do a once a year uh, birthday review? Um, everybody knows when their birthday is, everyone's got one. Um, the beauty of it is that your date of birth is printed on every prescription, so all the community pharmacists know when the annual review is due, so they too can prompt and support that message. They know when to expect new batch prescriptions if we're doing repeat dispensing for that patient. And it just felt like a good way to be able to optimise um, and sort of annualise and do a, a complete and holistic um, review looking across, we've got increasing numbers of patients on polypharmacy and that sort of comorbidity. Um, it just felt like to do a one-stop shop, a complete review, um, would be a more sort of um, holistic way to, to manage those patients. And also it's an opportunity to try and allocate it to the right person. Um, as I say, we've all got different scopes of practice, we've all got different areas of interest, uh, nurse with uh, an infinite prescribing qualification in diabetes and do a much better diabetes review than I am but it just felt like this was an opportunity to play to our strengths and allocate the person to the right member of our team um, and we thought is this a good place to to take on a pharmacy technician um, to 
be able to do a pre-screen, if you like, of these patients, order the relevant blood tests um, and any observations that are needed, and then allocate the, the patient to the most appropriate uh, member of the clinical team then. Um, so say uh, somebody with RA um, on a DMARD might have blood to the phlebotomist and then a follow-up appointment with me because my background would be in persistent pain. Um, but then somebody who is a diabetic might say, go to a healthcare assistant for their diabetic foot check, blood pressure check, weight, that sort of thing, and blood tests, and then have their second appointment with the, the nurse practitioner who's a specialist in diabetes. So it just felt like an opportunity to, you know, and do what only you can do. Um, and whilst we were doing it, the pharmacy technician could also review. So um, the QAIF, the, the GP contract, effectively pays extra for us to look after the patients who are on certain chronic disease registers and um, a pharmacy technician is best placed to make sure that those registers are accurate and up to date. Um, and in doing so, that increases and you know, optimizes the, the practices uh, prevalence of, of those chronic diseases and make sure that the people are on the correct registers. So things like, for example, if you're not coded correctly as having um, cancer, then you don't get called automatically for a flu vaccination and, and things like this. So it was improving quality as well as um, there were cost implications as well. So this was our proposed scheme so that every, say the 1st of October, the pharmacy technician would run a search for patients um, whose birthdays are in November, who are on repeat medicines and or a chronic disease register. So out of about 1,000 patients a month, that takes it down to more like 600, so about 150 patients a week. Should go into their notes, review, order what bloods, if any, would be needed, and then allocate them to the most appropriate clinician. Uh, those blood results and, and observations would come back to us, um, and then we would be able to, to do that review with all of that information in hand. And I felt better about that, maybe because I'm a hospital pharmacist, I want my obs chart, drugs chart, but I felt better about doing a review, knowing that I had all that information up front, rather than doing the review blind, if you like, and reauthorizing medicines, and you'd have to retrospectively undo that if some of the bloods came back unsatisfactory or there was something to see. Um, so in terms of our swim lane maps, when we ran those, uh, pharmacy technician is now first port of call, We've got a receptionist making an outbound phone call to ring the patient and say happy birthday for blood test. Um, and then either the pharmacist or the nurse practitioner to do the, the review. You'll notice the bottom line is a gap. That's where GPs used to go. We're no longer involved in them in the process. So when it came to, to going back to the partners, I think it would be fair to say they weren't entirely clear what a pharmacy technician was, um, but then why they apparently now really needed one. Um, but they were fantastic and it was part of the business case that we were able to say, now we're going to be spending £16.26 looking after that same diabetic, as opposed to the £44 we were spending on them before. Appreciate these are soft dollars, this isn't real money, but it is an indicative cost um, in terms of what the practice is investing. When you times it by the 600 people a month that we've got on current disease registers or on regular repeat medicines, that comes out at £178,500 a year. So that persuaded them that a pharmacy technician, that and the complete absence of a GP line, I think might have been a turning point as well. And the project was launched. So uh, we started in August of uh, 2019 with the September babies. Uh, we noticed straight away that we were increasing the availability of GP appointments because we were no longer asking them to carry out any medication reviews. Um, phlebotomists seem to me to be the HGV drivers of the healthcare world, and there were never enough of those previously. But as I say, that was because there was a lot of duplication of people having repeated blood tests for different disease conditions um, through, scattered through the year, whereas now we're doing a one-stop shop. Um, previously, there was this rush for year-end for quaff, quaff. Um, and you know, reviews needed to be completed by the end of the, the quaff, quaff year. Um, and now that wasn't happening because they were being evenly distributed throughout the year based on their date of birth. And because it was, um, we were reauthorizing their medicines or producing their batch prescriptions for 13 lots of 28, that's a full calendar year, it meant people were running out of their medicines on their birthday as well. So we had more confidence that we weren't going to miss people because they would run out of their medicines anyway and that would prompt them to come back through this system. So people who weren't engaging perhaps were encouraged to engage via that sort of mechanism. Uh, this graph, basically a run chart of who's doing the reviews. You can see um, blue line are our doctors 
um, before we went live, it was mostly them. Um, and the uh, yellow line is off on C technician, went from seeing no one to seeing everyone. Um, and the pink line at the bottom there stayed fairly flat, that's the nurses. They were always involved to a certain degree, particularly around diabetes and respiratory. And uh, then the gray line for pharmacy has just grown and grown, but at a sort of steady and controllable rate as well. But the summary is uh, on the left hand side, unhappy doctors, on the right hand side, much happier doctors. Um, I came back to this idea about the, these chronic disease registers. <clears throat> so those are the chronic disease registers, and those are snapshots of what our prevalence was and, and how many patients there were on each of those um, as, the, as the sort of uh, process rolled out. Um, as I say, pharmacy technician is perfectly placed to think, why is somebody on an ACE inhibitor and a calcium channel blocker, but not on the hypertension register, or why are they on denepresil, not on the dementia register? And so go back through and, and audit and, and find that diagnosis, which is often not been coded correctly. And it's those coding errors that mean that they're not on our disease registers. And so thing, there are clinical implications, as I say, around things like vaccinations and recalls and stuff, but also um, a cost implication too. So um, prevalence increased across the board as well. There are other unexpected benefits that we hadn't really thought about. Um, news travels fast in rural communities um, and word of our birthday MOT spread. Um, in fact, in the first lockdown, we had people ringing us our birthdays in April, what's happening. Um, patients really took it on board. I think that, I mean, I can tell you when my asthma review is due, but I think the people at Cambridge probably could. Um, and I think clinician satisfaction was increased as well. I think we all feel like we're playing to our strengths using our our scope of practice and not asked to operate outside that so much because we are seeing the patients that we are best placed to review and I think a holistic review although it takes longer is a more satisfying process to do a notice medication review of everything in one go with all of the observations and blood test results in hand would be the ideal way to do it I think and I think that there's less frustration and sort of duplication of, of effort and, and fewer sort of failure demands if you like where you know, patient meds need reauthorizing this is coming through as queries, the sheer volume of those has definitely decreased. And the other unexpected benefit, um, part of the Quaid contract is access standards that can be summarized as how quickly we've got on. Um, and by having a receptionist ringing out to book these birthday reviews, it took off the phone lines, all the people ringing in to say, I've had a letter about my asthma clinic or I'm running out of my medicines or, you know, all of those sort of queries were, were reduced and those were all um, telephone calls coming through. So, you know, it, that was a real benefit and, and helped us to meet our access standards there in 2019. So by the time we got to the end of February 2020, we'd uh, completed six months, um, we'd ironed out all of the, uh, the sort of teething problems and um, we'd seen half of our patients um, through that process and we were really starting to feel the benefits. Uh, crest of a wave, rising high, all was good. We were thinking we're definitely onto something here. We should think about uh, writing this up. And then the world changed. And as I said at the beginning, um, not all change is good. So I think the benefit, though, of having a structured process was we were able to like, very quickly do up a kind of red, amber, green escalation system. So when we're at red, if we can't get blood bottles, because you know, that's the latest thing, or if we can't get phlebotomists, or because, you know, of COVID and um, services being limited, how can we prioritize? If you were only able to do a small number of blood tests, who would you prioritize? Would you, you know, because all of these patients are being reviewed first by a pharmacy technician, she's able to prioritize. So we can say to her, okay, we want to see all the DOACs, all the DMARDs, chronic kidney disease, um, you know, complex polypharmacy in the over 80, these are the priorities. And so she is able to call those in as a priority. So it's become a standing agenda item now, and we were able to flex up and down through those sort of red, amber, green ex escalation points. And so the process has continued and we haven't missed a patient and we've plowed on through. Um, so yeah, I think that in summary, it is a showcase of what a pharmacy technician in particular can contribute in, in primary care. I think that a practice-based pharmacy technician using them for this kind of role really plays to their strengths. You know, I think she absolutely is the, uh, the captain of the tiny ship of order. And, and that has been a, a huge benefit. And that basically pump primes the entire process. And I think that having the ability to play to the strengths of the individual clinicians and keep them within their scope of practice has always been, um, you know, something that's been uh, an aspirational target too. 
I think more and more practices are starting to discover the same secret, and we'd definitely be interested in hearing from other practices that are doing something similar. Um, but I think as well, the opportunity costing and um, quality improvement methodology that we use could be applied to different applications, you know, outside of primary care as well. 